This video is a part 4. Make sure to watch the previous parts first. September 2014 The A button challenge was starting to settle down. At 82 A presses, Pat and Quick and Friends were in a bit of a dead end. No one had any leads on what could be improved. No one except Tyler Caney. Showing up out of the blue one day, he annihilated every expectation and took the A button challenge to the next level. While everybody was focused on a 120 star A button challenge, Tyler Keeney actually had a different outlook. His primary goal was to make it possible to beat the game in zero A presses, no matter the star count. Now Super Mario 64 is very famous for its zero star speedrun, but there's a bit of a problem with it. Most of the star door skips require speed generating techniques that make heavy use of the A button, like backwards long jumping or hyper speed wall kicking. A 0 star or even a 16 star run would automatically incur at least a dozen A presses to skip the 50 and 70 star doors. So the only reasonable method would be to find 70 different stars that could be collected in 0 A presses and beat all 3 Bowser stages without the A button. When he first looked at it, Tyler found that the lowest possible count was 9 A presses. Those included 2 A presses to beat Bowser in the Dark World, a half A press for board Bowser sub in Dire Dire Ducks as well as 5 other stars, 1 in Bowser in the Fire Sea, 1 to reach Bowser in the Sky, 2 within Bowser in the Sky, and because only 65 stars were retainable in 0 A presses, 3 additional A presses to get the required 70 stars. The half A press is important here because in the event that the A presses to reach 70 stars and to beat Bowser in the Dark World were all saved, there would no longer be a prior A press to leech off from. So from this starting point, Tyler made it his mission to lower that A press count all the way down to zero. His first discovery in that direction was a huge breakthrough because it allowed him to go to Hazy Maze Cave in zero A presses, unlocking a whole level that already had three stars at zero A presses. Because Pan and Koek was busy with college finals, Tyler took it upon himself to make a video about it. The crucial development is the Star Dance clip, which is made possible thanks to Mario's ability to grab onto ledges. During most kinds of jumps or in freefall, Mario can grab onto a ledge that he doesn't quite have enough height to land on. This allows him to reach a floor up to 180 units higher than his own position, up from 30 with a direct landing. A regular dive recover doesn't allow Mario to grab onto ledges, no matter how high, because that specific action type prevents Mario from grabbing the ledge. But when Mario collects a star, this unique falling action type called the Star Fall does allow him to grab a ledge. Normally, during a ledge grab, Mario is technically on top of the ledge while his visual model hangs off. This is the key mechanic that makes cannon less possible. In this case, because the star dance overrides the ledge grab animation, Mario instantly pops up onto the higher ledge and starts dancing. The star dance clip was revolutionary in that it allowed Mario to reach a ledge as high as about 280 units up from the 158 that a simple dive recover can achieve. There was only one simple problem, it required a star. Not only that, but a star in a very specific location. This was a major hurdle for two reasons. First, no stars are by default located somewhere that they can be useful to reach a higher ledge. But most importantly, in any one of the 15 main courses, collecting a star will automatically exit the stage. But there's one exception that conveniently sidesteps both of these key problems, the 100 coin star. This star appears precisely 245 units above where the 100th coin was collected, so its location can be pretty much anywhere that a coin can be collected at. But also, other than some castle secret stars, this is the only type of star that keeps Mario in the level after collecting it. Therefore, with clever manipulation, the 100th coin could be collected just beneath a high ledge and the star fall action could make Mario grab the ledge and save an A press. And then, because this is the 100 coin star, he would be able to stay in the level afterwards. This is the magic of the star dance clip. Tyler immediately used it in stand tall on four pillars. A Goomba knockback bounce into the star is just enough to pop Mario up on the grate, which has a warp that takes him further up the pyramid. This is now high enough to reach the miniboss fight without using A. A month later, still on his own, Tyler Caney discovered a massive new technique that he named a 207 dive recover. A regular dive recover can get Mario on platforms up to 158 units higher, but this special trick gets him up to 207 units higher. This is made possible because of the wall and floor hitboxes. If you remember, I said before that wall hitboxes extend up to 30 units below the top of the wall. Quick side note, if you need a refresher on earlier notions that I'm building onto, look out for a timestamp in the lower right corner of the screen. 
A dive recover gives Mario 128 units of height, so on a platform that is up to 158 units higher, Mario can dive recover just above the wall hitbox and onto the platform. If the platform is any higher, the wall will prevent Mario from reaching the floor. The floor hitbox, however, extends 78 units under the floor. If Mario finds himself somewhere in this region, he'll snap up onto the floor. Theoretically, Mario could dive recover into the bottom of this region and snap up to the floor, gaining up to but not including 207 units of height. In practice though, a platform is almost always surrounded by walls that prevent Mario from reaching this zone. But what if that wasn't always the case? This is the key discovery behind this new technique, misalignments. Super Mario 64 tracks Mario's position using 32-bit floating point numbers. So Mario's position on each axis can be virtually anything, including 8 million numbers just between 1 and 2 alone. The game physics calculation that checks the height of the floor Mario is on or above has a built-in shortcut. Instead of using the 32-bit floating point number for Mario's position, the programmers decided to convert it into a 16-bit integer. This lost some precision, sure, because any fraction would be rounded down to a whole number, but because one unit is such a small distance, a fraction of a unit would be completely insignificant. Well, it turns out that it's not that insignificant when the wall collision check does not make the same shortcut. This leads to a very specific, literal edge case scenario where Mario can be on the floor but beyond its bounding walls at the same time. This 1x1 one one unit square is beyond each of the wall hitboxes, but if Mario ends up here, his position will be rounded down for floor calculation, putting him on the floor. So for all practical purposes, in the direction away from the origin, floors extend one unit further than their associated walls, leaving a tiny exposed square at the outside corners. This means that any platform which has a corner pointing away from the origin in both axes has a 1x1 one one misalignment that can be used to bypass the wall hitbox and snap up onto the floor from 78 units below it instead of the usual 30. It seems rather small, but there actually are numerous instances where that makes all the difference. First, these platforms in Bowser in the Sky, where Tyler discovered the trick in the first place. As it turns out, all of these gaps that were just out of reach with a regular dive recover were not reachable using misalignments. All of them except the last one, unfortunately. But he was undeterred. He was determined to make Bowser in the Sky fully completable in zero A presses. Despite his already impressive track record of two major discoveries in a month, nothing would truly showcase Tyler Caney's creativity and mastery of the game like the Chuckya drop. From all the way down here, Mario is just on the edge of Chuckya's activation radius. When Chakya is deactivated, it stops moving and isn't being rendered, but it is still loaded. But there's one crucial function that still works, turning towards Mario. Chakya has two main behavior modes, chasing and turning. In chase mode, it charges forwards until Mario is behind it. This is what the white line demarcates. Then, it stops for about a second and a half and goes into turning mode. In turning mode, it turns until Mario is in the yellow cone, then starts chasing again. If Mario quickly goes from behind to in front of Chekia, he can already be in the yellow cone when Chekia starts turning. In that case, it turns by about 5.5 degrees or until it faces Mario directly before it starts chasing. This is important because of the geometry of the platform Chekia is on. Chekia has a built-in mechanism that prevents it from running off a ledge. If its next intended position is more than 50 units above the floor, that means it's about to fall off, so it will stop on the edge of the platform. This check is only made if Chekia is currently on the ground. If it's already airborne, this no longer matters. But how can Chekia be airborne if it can't fall off in the first place? Because of slopes. Chekia has a constant gravity of 4 units per frame squared, the same as Mario. On any given frame, if after falling down by 4 units, Chekia is on or just below a floor, then it's popped back up on the ground. So if Chekia moves onto a floor that is between 4 and 50 units lower than its current height, it will become airborne, and once it's airborne, the 50 unit limit no longer applies so it can now fall off from much higher. There's one last potential hurdle. Chekia can't just run around entire levels. It has a point called its home, and it can only willfully move away by a certain distance from that home. But thankfully, the distance is strictly horizontal, and by a stroke of pure luck, it happens to be just big enough to allow this strategy to work. Every piece of the puzzle can now fall into place. Mario performs a complex mating dance down at the bottom, on the edge of Chekia's activation radius. He makes Chekia turn to face him here, then moves back behind it to activate the stopping period. In that time, he quickly goes back within the yellow cone to have Chekia turn just a little more counterclockwise. 
He repeats this until Chakya faces in this direction as much as possible. Then he activates Chakya by entering the radius and makes it run up against the edge and onto the sloped ground here. At this point, he can only activate Chakya with dive recoveries and ground pounds. Once Chakya runs onto the slope, it becomes airborne and can now fall off, but it's headed in the wrong direction. So Mario falls back out of the activation radius, freezing Chakya in midair. Then he moves back behind it to make it turn towards him and reactivates it so it now falls down towards him. Again, he moves back behind it to make it stop before it falls off the course altogether. And from there, he's able to be grabbed and chucked on the upper platform and the final A-press in Bowser in the Sky had finally been saved. It's impossible to understate how unlikely this strategy really is. Every aspect of it just barely works. This wall allows Chakya to run up against it instead of getting stuck on the edge at precisely the right angle to allow Chakya to reach all the way to the slope while Mario is down below. The slope is just steep enough to cause Chakya to become airborne. The perfect placement of the edge of the activation radius allows for activating and deactivating it on command, and the perfect size of the area around its home allows it to move all the way to this point. It's even crazier when you consider that Tyler was working with very rudimentary tools and little understanding of all the mechanics I just described. The fact that this A-Press save is possible at all is nothing short of a miracle, but the fact that it was discovered over seven years ago is indescribably unlikely. You just can't make that story up. Again in October, and again on his own, Tyler Caney found yet another groundbreaking trick to gain precious height in specific scenarios, Vertical Speed Conservation, or VSC for short. Mario's vertical speed is a variable that's almost entirely independent from his horizontal speed. This is mostly a major hurdle for the A button challenge, but it can sometimes be useful. In certain circumstances, when Mario lands on the ground, his vertical speed isn't automatically set to zero. It remains what it was at the last moment where Mario was in the air. This means that if Mario was somehow able to land on a platform while he's moving up, he could get off of it later and retain his upward speed, potentially gaining more height than ever possible before. There are two reasons why this can't work, though. First, Mario can't really land on anything if he's moving up, and second, vertical speed is reset to zero as soon as Mario starts moving. But what if I told you that Mario doesn't need to move to move? The action of throwing a punch makes Mario inch forward a little bit, but it doesn't require moving the control stick. It also doesn't reset the vertical speed. So if Mario lands with a non-zero vertical speed, then punches repeatedly until he falls off the platform he's on, he will conserve that speed. But this doesn't fix the problem that Mario needs to fall onto something, therefore have negative vertical speed in order to actually land on it. Well, it turns out this isn't strictly true. There are some cases where it's possible to move up onto a platform, but they're relatively rare. For example, a platform that doesn't have any walls, like a magic carpet, can work. Also, if the platform itself is moving, it can move up onto Mario like an elevator. So it is indeed possible to land on a platform with positive vertical speed, and there are some very specific cases where this trick could actually come in handy. At the end of October, Pan and Koek finally had enough time to come back to the challenge, and he was immediately met with this revolutionary work. He instantly recognized Tyler Caney's potential and invited him on the ABC crew, but he also saw the potential of these three new key discoveries. The floodgates were officially open, and improvements could start flowing again. First came the big house in the sky, where a dive recovery onto the magic carpet allowed Pan and Koek to conserve its vertical speed. Then, by getting pushed off the carpet, Mario enters freefall but gains height like a dive recover. Being in freefall means that he can wedge grab, allowing him to get onto these blocks without an A-press. Sadly, the last one is higher than the others, and one A-press was therefore still required. Next up was Big Boo's Hound, where this A-press was proving problematic for the four stars it required going up to the second floor. Again with VSC, but this time done using the stairs raising onto Mario, Panin was able to cut this A-press out, saving four at once. The Red Coin Star also required getting rid of that half A-press for kicking onto Boo's in this room, but Panin was able to figure it out using a dive recover instead. Then, in Dire Dire Docks, he found that these cork boxes can be climbed on using misalignments. This allowed him to reach this high platform in zero A-presses and without a pole clone, which again revolutionized four different stars. Bored Bowser's sub was now down to zero A-presses. Both through the jet stream and collector caps were also down to zero A-presses because the special caps could now be obtained without jumping. And finally, pole jumping for red coins could get rid of the initial half A-press and go down to a clean two. In Bowser in the Dark World, three tassers, Tyler, Panin, and Plush, and two new techniques combined to save the remaining two A-presses. 
Here, Mario does a dive recover into the crystal, which is made up of tiny walls in an interesting arrangement. By entering two wall hitboxes at once, Mario gets pushed all the way to here. Because the floor slopes up, this is enough to land immediately after the dive recover, allowing him to preserve the vertical speed all the way to here with repeated punches. The A press to enter the pipe was solved using a misalignment. Specifically, this corner points outwards from the origin, so Tyler Keeney was able to dive recover into the misalignment and save the final A press in this stage. Now in Rainbow Ride, Pan and Koek found another multi purpose A press save. This time, it was to reach the cruiser at the top of the stage. He used vertical speed conservation combined with a very precise complex lacketuleur to get it to fly up precisely into that corner. The VSC was achieved by making this block start falling, then dive recovering and landing one frame later on this block. Mario doesn't dip low enough to start being affected by the walls of that block, making this maneuver possible. Then, one punch gets him off the platform with vertical speed and the lacketu bounce gets him just high enough to grab the sledge. This brought Cruiser crossing the rainbow to zero A presses, and somewhere over the rainbow down to 1 because of the cannon shot. With the 120 star A press count down to 71, Pan and Koek and the ABC crew, including three more people, Kaze Emanuel of Rum Hacking fame, Ryan Strobach, and Pedro Victor, decided to make a prediction. How low would the A press count be six months into the future on May 13th, 2015? Everyone made guesses roughly around 60. Tyler Keeney was the most optimistic of them all with 54, predicting that 17 A presses would be cut down before six months had passed. Needless to say, every single one of these predictions would turn out way off base. Meanwhile, Tyler Keeney, who was more focused on any percent, tried to get rid of the A press to enter Bowser in the sky. He found that on the rainbow ride side of the room, he was able to use misalignments to ascend some of the steps, but two of them were being difficult. This one and the final step. The ramp on the top step complicated things a bit, but using a ground pound and some slight grinding, Tyler was able to make it up. The first step's problem is that it doesn't line up right for a misalignment to exist. Tyler could have used a slight kick bounce from Rainbow Ride, but because he was concerned with any percent where Rainbow Ride was not going to be entered, he had to find another method. He found the glitchy ledge grab. When Mario hits a wall, a check is made to see if he can grab the ledge. In short, the game checks for a wall hitbox at 2 points, 30 units above Mario's position and 150 units above, which is about the size of Mario's model. If it finds a wall hitbox at one point but not the other, it will try to find a ledge to grab onto by looking for a floor hitbox from 160 units to 100 units above Mario's position. Because floor hitboxes are 78 units high, this means that Mario can theoretically grab a ledge up to 238 units above his position. But if there is a ledge that high, wouldn't there be a wall below that ledge that the wall check would detect? Yes, but not always. Here's why. Wall hitboxes are 50 units wide perpendicularly to the wall, but at the edge of the wall they don't necessarily extend perpendicularly. They actually extend along the closest axis, either X or Z. So if a wall isn't aligned exactly along one of the axes, its hitbox will have a slanted shape along its edges. In this corner, both walls extend along the X axis, creating this shape. When Mario is in this zone, he's in the low wall hitbox but not the high one. So the game detects a wall 30 units above Mario but not 150 above him. Therefore, the floor check is triggered. Now, because Mario is colliding with the low wall, the game uses the line perpendicular to that wall to check for a floor. Because of the lower wall's orientation, the perpendicular line is angled towards the higher floor so the floor check finds that one and Mario grabs the higher ledge. If the walls extended perpendicularly instead of along the closest axis, this would not have been possible. Also, there was finally only a single A press absolutely required to beat the game to jump off the pole in Bowser in the Fire Sea. In these frantic two weeks, vertical speed conservation had proven to be a key asset to gain height by preserving positive vertical momentum. But what about negative vertical momentum? Well, yes, negative vertical speed can be preserved, but obviously, in a challenge where height is precious, falling even faster than usual is crazy to even consider. But the closest thing to crazy is genius. Plush figured out that for Express Elevator Hurry Up, he could conserve negative vertical speed to fall down faster after activating the elevator, making it possible to reach the platform using only B swimming and cutting the half A press that was left in the star. Plush was a relatively rare contributor, but this time he came up with another A-Press save in the same month in Jelly Roger Bay. Through the jet stream's A-Press, the jump into the star could be skipped by positioning Mario in the center of the jet stream so that it would push Mario up into the star once the metal cap expired. 
This seems obvious in hindsight, but it's actually extremely precise to the point where it had been tried before and discarded. The stream pushes Mario up, but also outward, so he has to stand on the exact center, give or take a tiny fraction of a unit, in order to not miss the star. Plush was on a hot streak. He struck again, this time in dire dire docks. He found that the underwater shell's higher speed could be partially preserved with frame-perfect bee swimming. Normally, bee swimming has a speed cap of 7 units per frame, but with this method, it could hold a speed of 16 units per frame. This is enough to do chests in the current without being sucked into the whirlpool, so another half a press was taken out of the game. The next improvement came a whole month later, at the very end of 2014. Pan and Koik, not to be outdone, was still busy concocting absurd routes that no one else could have even remotely considered. And this time, it was one of his best. Swinging in the breeze and zero A presses down from one. The key new glitch in this route was hands free teleport. Usually, when Mario's holding an object, he cannot use a warp. But when he's holding an object hands free, he can. The result is that the original object remains in limbo, but the held object is discarded. This means the original object cannot be retrieved from Limbo and is stuck there forever. But of course, there is one exception, Bob-Bombs. After a hands-free teleport with a bob -omb, Mario will no longer be holding anything, which gives him back his wide range of actions, but he'll still have the original bob -omb hovering in front of him at all times, invisible but still tangible. He can recover that bob -omb by grabbing it straight out of Limbo. Now, what happens if that bob -omb is also in a bloated state? Well, because it's larger than usual, it pushes Mario backwards, again by a varying amount depending on the exact frame it was grabbed on. And this is the reason behind the behavior that Pan and Koik exploits in this star. Let's go through the route. First, he goes up to the cruiser using VSC and the Lucky to bounce like in the other stars. Once there, he grabs a bloated bob hands-free by being pushed off the edge as he grabs it. Then, he carefully navigates to the top of the red coin maze while preserving the hands-free state. In order to reach the warp while hands-free holding a bloated bob -omb, he needs it to be bloated enough to give him a large push. But after taking the warp, the large push becomes a little cumbersome, so he re-grabs the bob -omb and uses this thin ledge to get hands-free holding again, but this time with a smaller bloated bob -omb. Back onto the maze, he now has a bob -omb that gives him a slight backwards push. He makes his way to here where he lures the fly guy up and bounces onto it to twirl over to this platform. Then, he pushes the Goomba up the slope using the hitbox of the invisible bloated bob -omb in front of him. But because the bob -omb pushes Mario backwards, he can't get enough forward momentum to climb the slippery slope. But that's no problem for Pat and Koik, because this is what he does instead. From there, he can push the Goomba all the way to the star, get rid of the bob -omb, and use a damage knockback bounce to reach the star and save an A-press. The year was now 2015. Pan and Koik went back to pole jumping for red coins. The new misalignment allowed him to reach the cap box and using the surrounding walls perform the hat in hand glitch. This in turn allowed him to release a pole clone remotely by setting the hope in another level beforehand, namely Womp's Fortress. With the preset hope, he was able to release a pole clone here in between these two poles and use it to navigate to and back from the red coin. Pole clones are an exception to the one interaction rule. Mario can actually reuse them as many times as he wants because the interaction with the pole does absolutely nothing to the pole's interaction status as opposed to enemies or coins. This let him save an A-press but reintroduce the half A-press entering the level, bringing the star down from 2 to 1.5 A-presses and saving 1 A-press overall. Shortly after, he also revisited Big House in the Sky which was left at 1 A-press for this blue box, too high for VSC and not oriented properly for a misalignment. Of course, that doesn't mean it was impervious to Pan and Magic. He figured out that an exploding bob -omb could push Mario through the wall and because the carpet would be inside, he would have ground to stand on while inside the box. And because there are no inside walls, he could get pushed back out easily on the other side. But he was facing a pretty peculiar problem. In short, he wanted to bring a bob -omb to this place while also having the carpet be active. This makes things a little complicated because the carpet ride involves users of VSC and those involve a diver cover, but diving with the bob -omb in limbo automatically causes Mario to grab the bob -omb instead. This meant he needed to somehow bring a bob -omb here, but also be able to perform VSC on the box immediately before. Also, because cloning bob -omb's involve reaching the cruiser, he had to use Lakitu to get there, which prevents the other Lakitu bounce that's used in this route. 
So now he had to figure out a way to use two different bob to clip inside those two different boxes on the same carpet ride. The solution he came up with was quite involved. First, he went up to the cruiser and cloned a bob which he dropped to break the cork box below. This simply frees up the space for later. Then he cloned another bob which he released in such a way that it would eventually fall down to the platform below, but only after a bit of walking around. Finally, he grabbed a third bob bloated this time, and carried it hands-free to the warp. Meanwhile, the walking bob deactivates until Mario comes back. Now, something interesting happens with bob after a hands-free teleport. When Mario does a hands-free teleport, the bob actually doesn't follow him. It only does as soon as Mario enters its activation radius, at which point it remembers it needs to hover invisibly in front of him so it snaps to his position. In this case, it happens that the warps are just a little bit further apart than the activation radius. So when Mario warps, the bob stays on the red coin maze and Panin makes sure to stay out of its activation radius until he's ready to bring it back to Mario. Once that bob is positioned, he takes the carpet ride. This time, as he passes under the bob on the bridge, it reactivates and falls off below when he can retrieve it. He uses that one to clip inside the box that the Lucky 2 Bounce used to clear. Once he reaches this point, he performs VSC just before entering this bob activation range. He lets the wall push him off the platform since he can't punch 2 inch forward, and now he's ready to re-grab that bob from Limbo, clip through the final box and save the last day press in this star. After this madness, you'd think Pan and Quick would take a break from Rainbow Ride for a bit. Well, you'd be wrong. He tried to apply the same bloated bob hands-free teleport strategy to tricky triangles, but no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't quite reach the star. During that process though, he needed to get the fly guy in a perfect location, and in doing so, he discovered a new technique, fly guy manipulation. This is a bit of a complex one, so let me try and summarize it. Fly Guy has three states, flying around, chasing Mario, and going back to its home. Again, like for all enemies, Fly Guy's home is a point in space that it will always try to fly back to when it strays far away. If Fly Guy is currently far from its home, then it will try to go back home unless Mario is low enough below it, in which case it will chase Mario instead. This state change only depends on the height difference, regardless of lateral distance. On top of that, Fly Guy's state can still be influenced even if Mario is outside of its activation radius. Although it won't move, it's still able to change states, rotate and gain vertical speed, affecting how it's gonna behave whenever Mario enters its radius again. The space below Fly Guy can be subdivided in three zones, high, medium and low. For it to start chasing Mario, Mario needs to be in the low zone. Now there's a special case that happens if it starts chasing Mario, and shortly after, Mario is in the high zone. Fly Guy will then lunge at Mario instead and gain significant vertical speed. If Mario activates Fly Guy again at that time, it will lunge up and ahead, then return to a normal state. Sometimes, Fly Guy can also start to spin in place while it's in lunge mode. This behavior randomly occurs based on RNG, which can also be manipulated. By strategically re-entering the low zone and back to the high zone, it's possible to get Fly Guy to face any angle and lunge at that direction when it's activated again. With all of this in mind, it's theoretically possible to make Fly Guy go anywhere we want. Of course, provided that at all times there's an accessible point to manipulate its state and another accessible point to activate and deactivate it at will. In short, Fly Guy manipulation is possible, but it requires an amount of planning and effort only matched thus far by a handful of the most ludicrous strategies. So with this new tool in hand, Pan and Koek was able to use a better way to reach the Tricky Triangle star. He got the Fly Guy to lunge all the way to this platform, where he could bounce on it and twirl directly to the star, saving an A-press. But now there was an interesting question. Would it be possible to get Fly Guy so far and so high up that it could be used to go from the cruiser to the platform where the Somewhere Over the Rainbow Star is? Was it even possible to reach the platform with a single twirl? Tyler Caney and Pan and Koek set off to answer that question. It took three weeks of planning and testing and tassing, but they did it. The resulting route is too complicated to break down step by step. The luring itself is a masterpiece, check out the notes for a link to a video showing how it was done. Given the rudimentary tools they had at their disposition, it's impossible to understate how astronomical the task to get Fly Guy across and up the entire level was, while also juggling Lakitu for that bounce to reach the cruiser. And now, after all of this work, they had Fly Guy at the very top of the cruiser's mast. It was time for the final tour de force.
And with this incredibly tight twirl, one of the unlikeliest Apresses to ever be saved was now gone. But Fly Guy manipulation wasn't limited to only Rainbow Ride. It turns out that Snowman's Land also has a Fly Guy, and that level still had one pesky Apress left in Snowman's Big Head. Using Shell Hyper Speed, Panin was able to ascend steep slopes all the way up to the Ice Bridge, and from there, a carefully manipulated Fly Guy lunged into him, sending him flying up to the star. Snowman's Land was now fully done in zero A presses. Meanwhile, Tyler Caney and Plush were hard at work to pull off another creative strategy in the Volcano of Lethal Lava Land. Lava boosting can be used to gain a great amount of height at once at the cost of three sectors of health. So while it is a very useful tool, it can only be used twice, otherwise it would kill Mario. However, there's one way to get around this limitation, refilling Mario's health midway. Spinning hearts heal Mario when he runs through them. The faster he runs through a heart, the faster it will spin, which in turn refills Mario's health faster and for a longer time. So this is what they came up with. First, they get some height to do a slight kick bounce into the lava waterfall in order to reach the high bridge with two lava boosts. There's nothing funky going on here, Mario bouncing on lava with a slight kick is purely intended behavior. Then they go over to the spinning heart and dive into it, touching it with roughly 48 speed. That causes the heart to spin faster and longer than usual, giving Mario a lot of health back. They use that to get back up to the bridge with higher health than before, pick up coins to fill Mario's health up, and use another lava bounce to reach this higher platform. But they'll need better to get to the star. So they slight kick bounce back to the lava waterfall, picking up the last two coins, and they now have just enough health for two more lava bounces that give Mario barely enough height and distance to cross the gap to the highest platform in the volcano. That brought Hot Footed into the volcano to zero A presses, an elevator tour in the volcano from two down to one A press. During that time, Pan and Koek was working on Vanish Cap under the moat. While the other special cap switches had features allowing to get on top of them without jumping, the blue switch was problematic because there was nothing to work with. On top of that, even new discoveries didn't seem to help. There was no star to work with, no nearby ledge to use VSC, and while the switch did have a misalignment, it was 247 units above the ground, too high for a 207 unit misalignment dive recover. But Patton still wanted to test it. And in doing that, he found that the base of the switch also has a misalignment at the same spot. So by diving into that misalignment, he could get up 72 units, then dive recover and ascend the remaining 175 units using the second misalignment. All special cap courses were now done in zero A presses, including the A presses needed to reach them. March 2015. The A press count is already down to 57, with two months to go until the predictions deadline. At this rate, it still looks like Tyler Keeney might get close with his guess of 54. And that's when things took a wild turn. Tyler was looking for a way to reach the Piranha Plants platform from the Tiny Allen painting. You see, the problem with Tiny Huge Island is that entering the huge painting takes an A-press, and entering the tiny painting leaves you stranded in the starting area. Figuring out a way to get out of there would indirectly save an A-press in the castle even if the star itself was already possible in zero A-presses. He found a way to get across both gaps using Tiny Goombas. First, this one to bounce onto the middle platform. And then, that one can fall off from above, and a precise dive recover could hit it and bounce Mario to the piranha plants. From there, the pipe could be entered using a misalignment on its outer corner, and the rest of the star was trivial. Pan and Cook got to work, and after four hours of Goomba manipulation, he managed to pull it off. One of the castle A presses had been saved. But the story doesn't end here. As it turns out, from this platform, the rest of the island is painfully close to be fully accessible. There's only this gap separating Mario from saving the A-Press on every single tiny huge island stage entry, which would be massive. Unfortunately, no misalignments can be exploited, and VSC can't be used because the level geometry doesn't allow for it. There was one trick left in the bag of new discoveries, the Star Dance Clip. Theoretically, it would be possible to get up if a star was positioned perfectly in that gap. But how would you get a 100 coin star here, of all places, with only access to a tiny fraction of the island? You can't, of course. Unless you're Panin Koek and Tyler Caney. Back in 2010, Panin had already figured out the way to get infinite coins in Tiny Huge Island, and that method involves the piranha plants. If they're hit on the last possible frame as they shrink back into the ground, piranha plants can give coins again. This process can be repeated infinitely many times. However, once he did get to 99 coins, Panin still needed a way to get his 100th coin precisely in that corner. 
Thankfully, when the plant dies, the coins spring out in a direction and speed fully determined by the RNG value. By manipulating that to be exactly what he wanted, Panin could get the coin to fly out directly to that corner. But this was extremely precise. As it turns out, of the 65,000 possible RNG values, only 17 of them could provide sufficient speed and the correct angle to make this possible. On top of that, to milk all the extra distance he possibly could, Panin also abused object tangibility mechanics. Objects like cork boxes, elevator platforms, rotating platforms, seesaws, and many others are only tangible if Mario is close enough to them. That distance is surprisingly short. As soon as Mario walks away just a bit, other objects like coins or enemies will fall through these platforms. If you pay close attention, you can actually see the coins start falling through between each box. That's Panin using this mechanic so that the coin would fall just enough to be pushed forward by the outer wall of this cork box. Then he enters that cork box's tangibility radius just in time for it to catch the coin. In the end, that was just enough to get the coin in the right spot before it disappeared. From there, Panin could do the star dance clip using the 100 coin star, and he was now on the mainland in zero A presses from the tiny painting. And that saved five A presses, once for every star in Tiny Huge Island except for the first one. On the very same day, Panin also found a way to get up from this point of Tic Tac Clock to this point in only one A press instead of two. He did it by using a bob bomb to clone coins all the way up to 99, then performing his usual shenanigans to reach this point with a bob bomb at hand. He collects the coin right here, spawning the 100 coin star, then uses VSC in a star dance clip to get all the way up onto the ledge. From there, one A press is required to jump off the pole, so an A press was saved in three different Tic Tac Clock stars for a total of eight A presses in a single day. In the meantime, Pan and Koek was also very committed to saving the A press for top of the town, but no matter how hard he tried, no matter from what angle he looked at it, he always hit a wall. He tried so many different strategies, in fact, that he came up with a list of 10 different actions. If even one single action from that list could be done in zero A presses, the star would be solved. Here they are. Enter the painting at the high water level. Return from downtown on the low water level. Hold Chucky as a light object on its platform. Get Chucky onto the plank. Get past the wall hitbox on the star platform with less than 50 speed. Have at least two airframes while diving onto the spinning platform at high speed. Have one more unit of room on the star platform. Bring a flame or a flame clone onto the star platform. Get one more unit higher than a dive recover on the star platform. And finally, be able to remotely open the star block. Pan and Quick was so close, yet so far. And that's when Plush discovered that it is possible to hold Chakya as a light object on its platform. Every object that can be carried around can be either light or heavy. When Mario carries a light object, he can walk around fairly quickly with the best animation in the entire game. If the object is heavy though, Mario's movement is extremely limited. Also, the game always expects you to grab heavy objects with a punch grab. You can't dive grab Chakya, and you would never be expected to grab it in water either. So those two grab actions always default to the light object holding state regardless of the weight of the actual object. But as it turns out, you can in fact grab Chakya in water. After that, Mario will be walking around as if he was holding a bob -omb or a box. Unfortunately for this star, that wasn't quite useful enough. The key new discovery was that it is possible to dive grab Chakya, but only if it's done a couple of frames after punching, for the same reason why cloning is possible. This can be achieved by standing right on the edge of a platform. Shortly after punching, Mario starts falling and dives on the same frame. That allows him to grab Chakya and land back on the platform at the same time. Because he used the dive grab action, Mario defaults to holding a light object and he can carry Chakya around with much more freedom. Panin used this to get Chakya up onto the plank, and from there, he could carry it over to the spinning platform where he could get thrown into the star. Another easy A-press save in the books. You know, it's been a whole three days since Panin Quirk last blew everybody's mind with a comically absurd cryptic sequence that somehow comes together into an absolute masterpiece. How about we go for a ride in Womp's Fortress? The only A-press left in that stage is into the top of the fortress. But first, a quick stop in bob -omb Battlefield to place the hope in a convenient location. This is a pretty high point, so a few Goomba clones are needed to do the trick. Now in Womp's Fortress, Panin first uses the Metal Cap to perform the Hat in Hand glitch, then collect some coins. The 100 coin star will come in handy here. He also throws a box, but wait, where does it go? Ah, there it is. And there it goes again. Whoa, there it is. After dropping it at the top of the slope, he finds it over there. 
As you may have guessed by now, the hope that was set in Bobham Battlefield translates to a point high above this arrow platform. Now he uses that box to collect the 100th coin right next to the tower. But he needs one more piece of the puzzle. He goes back down and gets the other cork box on the stage. He plays catch with Schrodinger's box once more and brings the box to the top as well. And now, don't blink. So what just happened? As Mario threw the box, it warped to the hope. Panenkoek placed it at this exact position so that the box would land on the elevator platform at this precise angle. Mario quickly gets into position with the pause buffered dive recover before the box falls on top of him and pushes him off the platform. He enters free fall and ground pounds. Meanwhile, the box's bounce trajectory perfectly follows him, pushing him forward for the entire duration of the ground pound. This allows him to touch the 100 coin star much higher than would otherwise be possible. And from there, a simple star dance clip gets him up the rest of the way onto the sledge and the rest of the star is trivial. This brought Wom's Fortress to zero A presses and the total A press count down to 45, completely eclipsing every single prediction made by the ABC crew with two months to spare. But the next two months did not end up as fruitful as January and March were. Most members of the ABC crew were busy with college and other responsibilities. Nonetheless, a major advancement was made. This time, they got outside help from a speedrunner. Japanese runner Honey was practicing Bowser in the sky when he ran into this glitch by complete accident. You can see the bob disappear, but if you pay close attention, you can see that it reappears way off in the distance. What could have possibly happened? Soon enough, Tyler Keeney, Plush, and Pan and Koek were on the case. They eventually managed to recreate and understand what happened, and that's when they realized they had a shiny new tool to break the game with instant release. The way this works is actually very simple. It has to do with the fact that the held object's last position only updates if the held object needs to be visually updated. With instant release, Mario bonks into a wall on the same frame that he grabs the object. Bonking automatically drops the object Mario's holding, so before the held object has any time to be drawn in Mario's hands, it's already gone. Because the object is being dropped, it's released at Mario's vertical position but at the hope laterally. This is what's being observed in Honey's clip. The hope was somewhere on this line and the bob -omb was released at Mario's height. Now this had important ramifications for the A button challenge because it was now possible to remote drop an object without the hat in hand glitch and without the massive restrictions of transport cloning. The only restriction this time was there had to be a way to grab the object and bonk into a wall at the same time. This new technique immediately found a use in TikTok clock. By setting up the hope in wet dry world beforehand, Panin is able to use instant release to warp a bob out of bounds far enough away that Mario is out of its activation radius. Then he uses the other bob to clone coins and gets all the way to 97. Then he places a flame clone under the ledge. Of course, as he releases it, he instantly gets burned which uses up the clone. But all he has to do is clone a new flame and release it next to the first one just like he had done with Goombas before and this second clone would be usable. After that, he collects these coins, making sure to clone one of them to collect it right under the ledge, spawning the 100 coin star exactly where he wants it to be. And now, everything is in place for the magic to unfold. A dive recover into a flame bounce into a star dance clip gets him all the way up to the ledge. From there, dive recovers get him up the cogs where the bob magically appears. This is because as soon as Mario enters the bob radius, it's reactivated, but because it was dropped out of bounds, the game puts it at Mario's position as a failsafe. And now he gets across to the cage and uses VSC to reach the star, finally lowering Roll into the cage to zero A presses, a feat that seemed absolutely impossible not even two years before. And Pat and Koek was not even done in TikTok clock. The red coin star, sitting at zero A presses for a while now, could obviously no longer be improved. But that didn't stop Panin from trying anyway. And that's when he came up with something truly incredible. Negative A presses. Okay, not really, but this is the next best thing. TikTok clock always takes one A press to enter because the clock face is so high up. But what if there was a way to collect the star in such a way that once Mario returns to the castle, he's somehow able to re-enter the stage without the required A press? It seems impossible because changing maps like that resets almost every variable and strips control away from the player until the celebration is over. But there's one glitch that can still affect Mario despite all that, spawning displacement. When Mario is standing on the platform and suddenly isn't anymore, the platform will displace him for one additional frame despite him no longer being on it. When Mario leaves the moving platform by exiting the level via the pause menu, collecting a star, or even dying, this extra frame of displacement is applied to Mario as he spawns in the castle. Now for a regular moving platform, this effect is barely noticeable. 
but for a rotating platform, displacement is applied as a rotation from the platform's center. As such, objects are moved proportionally to their distance to the center. And that is precisely why this glitch can be useful. Here's what Panincourt did. He cloned the red coin star using one of the bob bombs and collected it while standing on the moving spinner. The level unloads with the spinner rotating clockwise and Mayu still standing on it. Now when the castle loads, it occupies the same coordinate system as TikTok Clock, but in a completely different way. The position of the spinner in TikTok Clock ends up far enough away from where Mario is spawned that the rotational displacement is greatly magnified. As a result, Mario is moved down significantly enough that he ends up landing on the clock instead of in front of it. One of the six A presses to enter TikTok Clock had been saved. There's just one tiny caveat. This glitch was fixed immediately after release, which means that it is only present in the Japanese version of the game. In every subsequent release, including North American and PAL, this glitch has been patched. Therefore, this A-Press save came with an asterisk. It had to be done on the Japanese Nintendo 64 version of the game. This is as valid a version as any other, so there was no inherent problem with it, but it's just something to keep in mind. Another unfortunate detail is that while this looked extremely promising at first, it actually couldn't be used for any other TikTok clock star, because since they're all already present from stage load, they can't be cloned. Collecting a star on a moving platform, especially with conditions as precise as they need to be to save the re-entry Apress, was simply not possible for any other star. The addition of Tyler Caney to the ABC crew ushered the A-button challenge into a new golden era. The introduction of vertical speed conservation, misalignments, and star dance clips revolutionized the challenge like only Pan and Koek had done before. And yet somehow, he hadn't even made his most legendary contribution yet. On July 11, 2015, Tyler Caney was looking for ways to get even more speed than the 500 from repeatedly sliding on this slope. He found this corner where the open gate created the ceiling barrier. This allows Mario to build up speed using the slippery slope while staying stationary because he can't move into a ceiling. This was good enough to build up to 1700 speed at which point Mario would break out of this spot. But then, he found that he could turn around towards out of bounds while building up more speed. The ceiling had a limit, but out of bounds is infinite. Tyler Kinney had discovered infinite speed without the A button. 